yeah, but I also got a call from Health Canada. Okay. Right? And she's like, she's like, we heard you're doing a cannabis dinner. I'm like, where'd you hear that? <laughs> I'm Derek Fox, and you're listening to A Bunch of Losers. Travis Peterson is my guest today from MasterChef Canada. Although he did not win, he is winning as a leading cannabis chef. We discuss cannabis food, pop-up dinners, and even test his level of Canadianness. Let's go, loser. Like, do you have any branded stuff? What do you mean? Like, do you, for like Epic Mega, do you have any hats and that, that you not wear? Yet, not yet. We're, we're getting there. I actually like, sometimes I'm like, I feel kind of pompous. Like, yeah, look we, at my yeah, brand. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. But. Well, it was like that when we were in, like in my band days, when we tour around, we'd have, like, we'd wear our shirts and we felt kind of douchey, but also <laughs> at the same time, we're like, we need to sell them. So yeah. we need people to see them. Yeah. yeah. You know? I mean, we were, that was our food money. Yeah. It was like, we got to sell five shirts tonight right. so we can all eat. Yeah, we've gone to like events before. My wife's like, "Put your hat on," and I'm like, ah, "I just feel cheesy." Yeah, kinda. but it's like, but it's you like, gotta, you yeah, do. it's like when you're doing events, it's like your yeah. restaurant on on wheels. Yeah. You know, like the chef wears his logo on on you know the restaurant logo on their yeah. on their coat. I've always been a hat guy, and for the last six years since Master Chef, it's which, like which is kind of food hats. Restaurant like if I go to a restaurant I like like a trucker hat with a yeah. cool restaurant, that's my hat right but there. But you got a great you got great hair and you just cover it up great gray hair yeah gray's cool i hey, i'm all about salt and pepper man yeah i mean you're missing front teeth like what do you care about gray hair canadian <laughs> right. you're so canadian right That's now right passage. i didn't realize this was a video so oh L- luckily i'm gonna have a big gold microphone yeah, it's like, it's a, like my, a gold grill it's my gold grill <laughs> <laughs> Yo, how did you lose your teeth? Uh, back from playing lacrosse when I was a teenager. And oh, not hockey. That no. was just so stereotypical. I, you know what? When they ask, I say hockey. But it, it was playing sports as a teenager. Uh, Wait, I was, hold I, on. Is, is, it, is lacrosse like not cool in Canada? Is, is like, no. Look, do you know lacrosse is Canada's national sport? Not hockey. No, it's lacrosse. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So there's like field lacrosse is really big down here in the collegiate level. Yeah. But up in Canada, we play box lacrosse, which is indoors. So oh, inside shit. a hockey rink, but on cement. So it's, it's five on five. It's like, it's basketball with a shot clock, but you're playing like street hockey. Oh my God. So yeah. hold on. So do you, did you take like a stick to the face or was it a no, ball? No, it, it, a fist. A fist. Yeah. I was, so I was a fighter through junior. You can fight like in hockey. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just like, and it's, it's way more physical. So lacrosse, like box cross is all cross checking and hitting and it was super physical. But you're a big dude. Someone yeah. was willing to throw a punch at you. Yeah. I, and I knocked your teeth out. Yeah. He hit me dead center. Fuck. Yeah. That's stay. Hey, you know, the saying, all you need is one good punch. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> My yeah. goodness. So yeah, it. uh, you know, they were there forever up until about three years ago and one fell out. And so I've been wearing a flipper, but how did it fall out? Uh, eating pho. Oh. Yeah, you know. And <laughs> it just <laughs> falls in the bowl? No, in the middle of the restaurant floor. It's super embarrassing. Oh. So. And did you pick it up? Yeah, I did. Oh. Uh. You know what sucked? The tooth fairy never showed up, man. <laughs> Instead, I got like a $10,000 dental bill. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're pay, paying for that tooth fairy. Right? My goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, so MasterChef Canada, I got I to gotta really... Uh, Stroke your ego here real quick. You went on MasterChef Canada, did not get an apron. No. Nope. And you have turned it into a very successful chef Thank career, you. touring all over Canada. Yeah. Tour, I mean, Thanks. I know touring's hard. Yeah. And and you did it with, you know, like f- like literally not even 15 minutes of fame, like 15 three minutes, seconds. Three minutes and 23 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> three minutes and 20, exactly. 20 seconds on TV. And now you're like one of the biggest cannabis chefs yeah. in yeah. Canada yeah. crushing it. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's the whole journey is crazy. Um, what sparked you to try out for MasterChef? Actually, uh, like a friend of mine really encouraged me to kind of go for it when the application process was open. To be honest, I used to work in the oil and gas industry. Yeah, I was a yeah. business development manager for an oil company, so sales and marketing, and um, you know, I just I wasn't happy. Like I kind of is that, o- is oil in Canada like as big as it is here? Like it's- yeah. So I, I lived in a place. I'm from Vancouver okay. on the west coast, yeah. uh, which is in a province called BC, British Columbia. The next province over, Alberta, that's like our Texas North. Okay. It's cowboys, cattle, oil, conservatives. Like okay. that's that's so. Um, in Edmonton and it's kind of where a big hub is. And I moved there. It's 
super fucking cold and but it's you go there to make money yeah, right there's yeah. just jobs there so uh, i was there for seven years but you know i got to that point where it's kind of what society says you're supposed to work towards right you want to have a six-figure job with mm-hmm. i had five weeks vacation i played like a ton of golf in the summer um it was just miserable you know i had like this big giant hole inside of me and nothing would fill it ever and I literally it was like Friday, four o'clock. I'm at work. I got an hour to kill. I found the application. I filled it out, and they called me on Monday. And I was like, "This is a joke," because I told people over the weekend I played out. And I'm like, "Who's who's joking on me?" And now, I, were you were you like cook, you were cooking? At I was home? a home cook. Yeah, I was a home cook, and I had you know I, I moved out at 15. Okay. So I right away I started cooking for myself, like tacos, lasagna, like just simple stuff. And then cooking for people is what I really felt. I just love sitting around a table with people and sharing food and stories. And, and so I always really like, cause I was so sports focused and I worked in oil and I always felt like the cooking thing was th- st- like friends knew that about me, but no one really knew that. Was it, was it stress? It was stress relief too, right? Yeah. I would come home yeah. five o'clock, turn the phone off, news on, smoke a joint and cook in the kitchen. Yeah. Right. Make dinner every night. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so when I went for that Master Chef thing at, you what'd know, you, what'd you audition with? What was your food? What was the food? It was a Brazilian moqueca. So moqueca is Brazil's national dish. Um, That's like out of left field. <laughs> well, it, it 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 isn't. It isn't. What ha- actually happened was when I was eighteen, I took off to Europe for okay. a year. So even further from Brazil. So yeah. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna get this one. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's far away from brazil but we're gonna find this so food <laughs> I, I i i went backpacking for a year and okay. before i left my mom came up to me and she gave me this book and she says you know a lot of people journal yeah when they go on these kind of trips right and she's like you're not going to journal but here's an empty recipe book why don't you just collect recipes from people your mom. Right? The, it's it's the most valuable thing wow. I own today. Yeah. I bet you at the time I rolled my eyes yeah. and was like, cool, mom. Like, thanks. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. but I stayed in all these hostels and I would meet people from different countries and I'd be like, would you put something in this book? Dude, all she- I mean, all chefs have to travel. I mean, we, yeah. we, we did a... We did a cruise around the Mediterranean, and it just felt like, you know, felt like Anthony Bourdain. Everywhere we went, it was like, let's just eat and eat and eat, and you gain 15 pounds. We didn't even eat on the boat. We were just eating in, through Italy, France, Spain. Spain's amazing, but it's like you get this, you know, you get this sense of culture, and, and you can see where food is traveled. You know, yeah. like, like for instance, like India, they have a t- – the, cilantro is huge in india yeah. cilantro is huge in mexico yeah. cilantro is huge in thailand yeah. they're all it's a very important herb in yeah. all those cuisines yeah you can just see it i mean it's like it's grown like a weed and it's influenced all their flavors yeah and so w- when you travel but then you learn how to use it differently it's right. like how how mexicans use cilantro versus how indians or you know thailand is it's all. how i've like when i finally took this on professionally yeah this is how I've grown as a chef is collaborating, working with other chefs. Yeah. You have to, you have to. Like that's, that's how I've changed. You know, when I got to master chef, like super confident on that airplane, the airplane lands, I get on the bus with all the other people. And all of a sudden now I'm in my head, like Mm -hmm. get us a little real. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you walk out to the clock. Yeah. And I'm like, clock's real. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, what am I doing here? Yeah. It's real. My head, I was like, what am I doing here? And I'm like, I am, I bombed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was one of the last people not to get an apron. It was a little bit of a twist. I, my meal in front of the judges, I forgot to put my prawns on. I left on the plate. The pr- I, yeah. Hold on. So explain the dish. Cause I so don't even know. So it was a Brazilian it moqueca. It's like a coconut based stew. So okay. it's Brazil's national dish. Whatever you catch in the ocean, you just throw it in the pot that day. Right. And it gets served with rice. So I did, um, the, the moqueca, the rice, and then I brought some spot prawns from Vancouver and I, th- do you think if you had got those prawns in the dish, you would have gotten an apron? Uh, I think they already knew who was going to get those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because but- what happened? Like, I don't know. I the dish. Yeah, because was- that's the thing about the shows. Because like, if your broth was fucking amazing, and it's an audition, yeah. so you're not technically you're not failing a challenge. The challenge is not prawns. The challenge is you're making them a dish. Well, the- if they saw the depth that they, you know, they wanted to see in the. In the everything was there. The thing was, they get, 
was season three, so they put this new twist where you had to get all three judges to say yes to get your apron, or uh. you went into another round to fight for your life, yeah, right? And okay. so, so I forgot, like, I got a yes, a yes, and then we think you need to be more focused because you left the fucking protein Bro, on the right. <laughs> on the, wow, so you even got two yeses? Yeah, I got two yeses. So that dish was really good, but I, I walk, I was heartbroken. Yeah, I was just devastated in my head i walked off set i had a little pity party for myself and i was like okay next round one more chance and went back in what was it so you got to cook something else so yeah so they took 16 of us in to the next round this do or die round okay right yeah uh, yeah so 16 of us went in eight got to go through got aprons of the 50 50 chance 50 50 chance so they gave us we had to do a maison plus challenge in 10 minutes okay right yeah they put Four through, they cut four, and they go, we're going to give you one more chance. Oh, my God. Right? And so I was into that round. They cut you from the mise en place challenge. No, I made it through that oh, one. Oh, you made it through that right? one. Okay. made it through that one. So now there's eight of us, yeah. and four are going to make it. And they're like, okay, that stuff you just mazed, you got to make a dish. Shit. Right? And I'm like, okay, I think I have something in my head. I'm going to do it with the chicken. And then they're like, but you only have 30 minutes. And so I was like, this chicken dish had the bone on it. I was like, I'm yeah. not, uh-uh, not doing it. So I made, mm. I did tacos, right? Yeah. And <laughs> for one, they called them tailgate tacos because I didn't, I made, uh, they were big and it wasn't plated nice. Yeah. But I didn't season my pico de gallo. And, mm. and that was the kind of funny part because when I brought it up and I put it down and, and I take a bite and he's like, did There's you no season this? And I go, nope. <laughs> because I never put salt and pepper on anything. I was uh, a home cook, man. I so yeah. I just to, was like, man, no, no seasoning on it. And well, that takes a lot to admit. I mean, that's yeah. that's tough. But you, I mean, your determination. I mean, I've seen it over the years. You know, I mean, you hit me up like the minute you saw me on on Master Chef. Yeah, your finale was while like your finale episode. Yeah, was while we were filming. Now they had taken all of our phones and stuff away from us, and okay. we were in the hotel restaurant, and we asked the table next to us. Can you tell us who won Master Chef? Oh shit! Right, because yeah. we wanted to know. Yeah, and they and, and they were like, like Claudia. I was, I was like Derek. <laughs> I'm like Derek's got it. Derek's got it. And they're caught it. And I was like, what? What? Right. And so, anyways, when I got out, I just and this is how I worked with a ton of chefs. I just reached out to, yeah, hey, this is yeah. who I am. Yeah. I asked if you wanted to come up to Vancouver, and it was dope. It was it was super dope. We, we got put like the newspaper showed up, and they dude, we sold that pop up out so yeah. fast. Yeah. It yeah. was really cool. It was it was the one of the first pop ups I've ever done. That was a it was the sec, that was the second pop up I ever did. Yeah, I was with you. Yeah, and I've probably done about five hundred now. Yeah, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> you know the pop the pop up thing is is tough because especially coming off the show. So you come off the show and you have the like the whole world is in front of you, and you feel this pressure from being on TV, and you got all these messages coming in on social media. And people just think like you're a chef and you know everything now. Yeah. And it's like I don't know shit. I went through a culinary boot camp. Yeah. Like personally, yeah. I went through a culinary boot camp with Gordon Ramsay as my instructor. Yeah. And believe me, I mean I soaked it all up. But like, you know, then I got to go into people's homes and like I I got asked to do a lot of private dinners. Yeah. And so I'd go into these people's homes and I'm like making I'm making it up as I go along because I felt like I I all this pressure to to give them something that they wanted. Yeah. And like, I mean, and then I then I got a little comfortable doing that. And then I was like, okay, so now my because you got to try new stuff. I was like, my goal is every new dinner I do, I'm gonna put something on the menu I've never cooked before and push myself that way. Yeah. And then I started, you know, then I started figuring out who I was as a chef and what I wanted to do with it. But that's the one hard thing about now, like being a private chef is like I'm just in the kitchen by myself right. every day, day yeah. in and day out, and so yeah, I, do, I don't get to collaborate with chefs like I used to. Um, but I did just have a chef come in and, and help me the other day, and then like there was this one little trick that she did, and I was like, ah, oh, this is why you have to work with other chefs. Yeah. Like we yeah. share this information, you know. Well, it's tricky because you come off the Master Chef show, and you know I, I always looked at it because everyone's like, you know, you really as you said, turned it into something because I feel the show opens a door for you. Yeah. Right. And it's up to you what you do with it. Yeah. Right. If you sit around and wait for stuff to come to you, it's I'll never, it's probably never. not going to happen. No. Right. And you got to go for it. But you know, you come out of that show and you know, I could, I could only imagine like you, 
have a lot more confidence coming out of the show than I did where you finished, but the culinary world does not accept you. No, not at all. And that's why I, I'm the nomad cook, not the nomad chef. Yeah, yeah. Because when I first started, like, I, I, I de- like desperately wanted the respect from yeah. the culinary industry. Yeah. The very first chef I worked for in Kelowna was the biggest dickhead and was like, you left a six-figure job to be a chef? Are you stupid? Like, yeah. he was rude and – not rude, but he just – he didn't – for one, all of his negativity towards me – was my biggest motivator in the first right. Time. I I have a very right. I have a very my haters story. were my biggest motivators, yeah. and I think if anything that first year for me, I just wanted to prove to everyone like yeah like I can do this yeah. and you know what was really crazy was I was at you know three minutes twenty three seconds of airtime two weeks yeah um I uh, went leaving for the show being the confident guy I was I had moved out of my place because I was going to be gone for 10 weeks so all my stuff was in storage so many people do that right so many people and do I was that. nine days in go gone. home yeah you're like, and I got nowhere, I nowhere to, to go. go um and I was so mad at myself I was like why did I do this right I had a beautiful house I had everything mm-hmm. like, and you know this is the end of 2015 um Four weeks after um, I get back, uh, this major recession hits the oil and gas industry, Mm -hmm. and I get laid off. Oh, shit. It was the best thing that ever happened at the best time. Yeah. Because you only had one there way to was go. no way yeah. I was going to pursue this chef career you had no at 31 anymore. years old, yeah. knowing I was only two weeks into Master Chef, right? Yeah. I had like, no, I'm sticking with this route, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, it, you know, they gave me a severance package, which gave me a six month safety net to get the thing up and going. There you go. You know, and I just went with it. And it was, you know, I had to sacrifice a ton to get it going in that first year. Yeah. Um, you know, by putting, you know, I moved out of my moved out of my house. I stayed with some friends. Like there was a lot of sacrifice. And I did the traveling between Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary. And you can make it look all pretty on Instagram and social media, but it was was a grind, man. Like there was bus trips and just, you know, it was a hustle that first year. Dude, there was a time we met to do a, uh, a dinner and you flew with a cooler. <laughs> I was like, dude, I fly with coolers everywhere. You're probably everywhere. The only one. <laughs> the only they, one. Yeah, I get recognized in the airport because <laughs> I got two cool. giant Yeti coolers and well, I go on. through. But I want to go back yeah. um, to to talking about how chefs perceive us because because you come off you know these shows and you got all this recognition and the public doesn't give a shit how you earned it. They're like, we want to dry your food. Yeah. But chefs are like, I fucking spent 20 years in these trenches burning myself every night, getting yelled at, you know, opening and closing, and and they've put in a lot of work, and it's mad respect. But they shit on you so fast coming, and, and like, you know, making it all the way to the finale was actually kind of like a blessing and a curse because it was like I had a lot of clout going in into things while you know the show was airing i could i could be like i want to do a thing here and do a thing there and uh, i would get asked to do a lot of charity events it was a really great way to raise money and i've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for different charities and this one hit me up in florida um golisano's children's hospital and it's at lima it was at a, a division of lima memorial and that's a hospital i was born at and i was like oh i gotta give back to this i gotta do it and so I'm like, okay, I'll do, I'll definitely, this is the first dinner I'm putting in a charity. Like, I don't even know how this goes. I, I didn't know, like, I didn't know you could auction off your services. I was like, okay, this is great. And then after this one, I did a lot. But so this charity has been running for like 20 years. It's at this restaurant in Cape Coral. I'm not going to say the restaurant. I'm not going to say the chef's name, but he's a dick. And I would tell him that to his face. Um, but he, I got invited by the, by the charity. And he was mad that I was being invited. He didn't want me there. He's like, I don't want this guy from TV. And and he's like, fine, if he's going to be there, he has to cook. And I was like, I can't cook. I was like, I'm flying in. I was like, I'm going straight to the news at like 7 a.m. I'm doing this news segment. I'm cooking on the news. I'm promoting your charity for free. You know, I'm promoting your restaurant on TV. I have no stake in your restaurant. I'm, I'm saying thank you for having this event to raise money for the children's hospital. From there, 
I'm going to a grocery store and doing a live demo in a grocery store, which I never done a live demo before. So I'm making that shit up. I'm like imposter syndrome to the max. Yeah. Because also in the back of my head, I have this chef that doesn't want me at his event tonight. And then from there, I'm going home, changing, and then going to the event. I'm like, I don't have time to cook. He was like, we'll give you chefs. I'm like, I know how this goes. You're going to give me the dishwasher, and he's going to be all excited, but he's not. He's, I'm going to get... I'm just going to look terrible. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not cooking at your event tonight. I'm coming here to raise money for this charity. So then it's time to auction me. Oh, I get there. I say hi to him. He gives me a cold shoulder. He's like told all the chefs to cold shoulder me. So no one's talked to me except for Brian Rowland, who has become like just a brother since like we've done so many events together and we've supported each other over the years. And we made a really great connection. And he, he opened his arms to me just like, sh- sh- He's always been there when I need advice. Like he's an amazing, amazing chef from my hometown. So it's time to do the auction, and they they roll the video of, of me on Master Chef, and and I'm like I'll do a three course dinner with a wine pairing. I set the record for this charity for the highest paid auction item, wow. fifteen thousand dollars. What went for my dinner, and then the other chef that was snubbing me had to go on after. And his dinner only went for eight grand, and he was just so fucking pissed. But I'm like, and then he didn't invite me back the next year. I'm like, I have, first of all, now I have hard feelings for you because I'm helping raise money for kids, and you're taking that money away from them because of your fucking ego. Yeah. And that's like, it's like, look, like I know you've worked so hard to get here, and you've sacrificed so much, but everyone has their own path in everything, mm-hmm. like from... You got guys in basketball that just make it right out of high school. And I'm sure there's other guys like, man, I I put so much work into college and I'm on fucking B team and you just skip ahead. Like that happens, right? And you just got to use it for motivation, right? Yeah. Yeah. You You do push it. And it's, you still got to earn, you got to earn yourself. You know, it's a rite of passage to get shit on by other chefs because you're going to get it even if you work the line or you start as a dishwasher. It, uh, you know, right. so. So, how did you go from, so you go, you, you, we got your master chef story and how you, you yeah. how did you transfer, like transition into cannabis cooking? Cannabis. So for about, um, it was 2018 is when I did the first cannabis event. So but leading up to that, what, what inspired so for, you to like, okay, well, I'm going to put I mean, cannabis in food. I mean, I've been smoking cannabis since I was like 16. Right and like heavy cannabis user. Okay. As you remember that first dinner we worked together on the prep day. I think I smoked like three blunts while we were doing prep, and you're like, "How are you still standing <laughs> and going right now?" Well, yeah, because uh, I have zero tolerance. Yeah, five milligrams. <laughs> I lose a whole week. Yeah. So uh, you know, I got started with the cannabis thing because it was 2018. Uh, Canada was legalizing cannabis federally in October. Okay. Uh, which is going to be so. There was part of me that was still trying to find my way now in this culinary world. Master chefs opened the door. My first two years, I was having some success. I was getting yeah. to work with cool chefs. Yeah. Um. You know, but I just still wasn't sure what I wanted to do because I didn't want to work in a restaurant. That yeah. was the one thing I knew I didn't want to do. Did you try it at all? Did you try working? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. It was just I'm 31 years old, and you know, right. it's I was just yeah, it it just wasn't gonna fit. I would be miserable, especially knowing that I could go into sales and make money. So I had actually had a plan like 2018 was gonna be the year that I figured it out where I was going as this culinary path, or I was gonna get out and go and get in the cannabis industry and get into like a, a sales management role, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, it was like March, March of that year, I'm standing at a bus stop in Vancouver and I look over and there's a local newspaper with, uh, chef Chris Soleil, the herbal chef out of LA here. Okay. He's, he's a cannabis chef. He came to Vancouver and Toronto and he did these two dinners and they sold out in four hours, a hundred people in each city. And I was like, this is six months before legalization. And the, the press is talking about it. And in my head, I was like, why isn't a Canadian doing this? I'm like, why? I'm like, like this is, I always look at like, we're so progressive in, in Western Canada with cannabis and it's been so accepted for the longest time. And I was just like, so I was kind of motivated. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? Cause I do these pop-ups. Like that's what I was. I was a pop-up chef, mm-hmm. you know, I'd go around and do these pop-up. Dinners. So I was like, okay, 
on 420, I'm going to do my own pop-up dinner. Uh, we turned our house into a pop-up restaurant. Okay. And over four days, I sold 164 tickets. And I was doing... Hold on. So how did you fit 164 people in your house? Because I was doing five seatings of 12 a day. Jesus. So every 90 was... minutes, flipping the oh room. Oh, my God. Crazy. Craziness. That's but, insane. But that's the pattern I work at now because There's that's... No... That's I have progressed it like I, I rent. There's no one on MasterChef doing that kind of turnover. I, like I've never even done that. At the most I've done yeah, is yeah. two of seventy. Well, I did two seventy-five person dinners, so yeah. seventy-five and then seventy-five. So I do that first that first weekend, and uh, CTV calls me like three days before. CTV is like our C, CBS, okay, Canadian, Canadian television, Canadian big, television, major network channel. The news they say. We heard you're doing a cannabis dinner. CTV also owns a right for MasterChef Canada. Mm -hmm. So they're like, and we heard you're doing a cannabis dinner and you were on MasterChef. Can we come interview you about it? And I was like, sure. So they brought a camera. They do a whole piece. And they told me, listen, it's only going to air in the local section of uh, BC, right? Okay. okay. So I'm watching the news. The local one goes and it, or sorry, um, the national news comes out and they fucking lead with the story. My cannabis dinner. And, but what they did was for their full round journalism of the story, they went to Health Canada to ask if it was okay that I was doing it. The oh, dinner. Yeah, they got to get the other side. They right. Gotta... And so you're like, fuck. The story airs nationally, and my phone and my emails start going nuts. Nice. All the other media agencies wanting to interview. Yeah, but I also got a call from Health Canada. Okay. Right. And she's like, She's like, we heard you're doing a cannabis dinner. I'm like, where'd you hear that? <laughs> Dude, cannabis strict. When I flew up, when I flew up, you made me so nervous. You you call, you're like, yo, when you get to when you get to customs and they're gonna ask you, like, just tell them you're you're on vacation. Tell and I'm like, they're like, they're gonna ask you about your knives. Like you had me so paranoid. You're like, I, I can't put any promotion. You're like, you have promotion, they're gonna check your Instagram. I've never been so terrified going into a country, well, and it's Canada. <laughs> well, you you gotta follow the rules, right? So, but like, but I didn't. So I did that dinner. The news crews came, and like the Health Canada, like because what did I actually did is I booked three of these cannabis dinners. I was gonna do three of them. The one thing I was adamant about is I didn't want to be called a cannabis chef. I was a chef doing cannabis dinners because in my mind I was like okay, this is a niche fad, culinary cannabis, yeah. because cannabis is legal now, everyone wants to try this, right. and then it's going to fizzle up, right. right? And I was like, I don't want to be pigeonholed in that. And this is, this is, everything that was coming out of my mouth was just 70 years of propaganda and stigmas mm -hmm. and misconceptions mm -hmm. about this plant, right? So I get an email from the Health Canada people saying, on, they send it to me at Friday at 4.30, can you please tell us the location of your dinner? <laughs> And I go, why is he sending this email Friday at 4.30 and not Thursday or Friday? Like, he waited to the last minute. To the last minute, so he didn't have to deal with it. He was like, I, I know deep down, he was uh, like, I want this guy to do this dinner. So, oh, okay. So I, I just didn't respond to the email. Right? Amazing. Right. And so I do, that, like, I do that first weekend, and I... Did you reply Monday morning? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I had a moment in that dinner where I was like... This is what I meant to do. I yeah. was having so much fun. Wow. Um, and, and here was the thing. So people bought tickets in twos. We only sat, we had a, a farm table in the, in the dining room. So 12 people. And it, they were strangers because no group's bigger than four usually. It's the best part about so doing pop-ups. sit all these people down at this table and, you know, cannabis just brings people together and it's chatty. And this one table comes in and I was like, uh, guys, we're really going to have to engage these people. They're going to have nothing in common. There was like four 20-year-old raver kids, a really wealthy Asian couple, a couple in their 40s, uh, and then this like 68-year-old widower came by herself. Wow. Right? And so and I just remember like, oh, we're going to have to really engage these guys. And they were so like in right That's away, the they're telling, they're yeah. ta everyone's talking, yeah. engaging, yeah. and um. You know, I was just, and then like trading phone numbers with each other and I'm standing in the kitchen just kind of listening. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, there's something really here. Yeah. Right? Because I don't serve alcohol at the events. Right. Right? So 
Do you so let I, people? Do you let people bring their own? No, no, no. Wow. no. Now we're doing cannabis mocktails and, and stuff uh, like that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, That's cool. um, you know, if I go into your house privately, sure, but of course, you don't need it, right? And ninety nine percent of the people coming to the dinner, it's their first cannabis dinner ever. So I'm like, weigh the experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I did that first one in Vancouver. And then we went to the two other cities in BC, Victoria and Kelowna, mm -hmm. and I did them there. And then all of a sudden, I started getting emails from people in Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto. So yeah, I was like, up. so I had once gone out to Toronto to do a pop-up, and I sold like 20 of 50 seats. So that's the biggest city in Canada. Well, it's also furthest from where you are. So I'm far uh, away, right? So I, did, I didn't do too well. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to try this again with the cannabis thing. And I sold it out in two days. Yeah. Right, it just yeah. sold out, and I was like, "Holy shit!" So, all of a sudden, now I was getting I before where I just traveled in Western Canada. Now I was getting to go over to Toronto and Ottawa yeah. and Montreal. So now, are you cool being called a cannabis chef? Yeah, it. Uh, you know, I served about so, a thousand people their first infused meal in those first three months. Like that's how many pop ups and wow. dinners I was doing. And then the day that Canada legalized cannabis. They put me on the front page of the paper, and it's just like Canada's cannabis chef. And I was like, "Yeah, but I'm a cannabis chef. <laughs> you got to go with it." Right? Dude, there's been so many, like, dude, there's been events where <laughs> I'm introduced on stage as the winner of Top Chef, and it's like, as soon as they say it, it's like I can't correct them anymore. I just roll it. But hold on. So with cannabis cooking, there seems to be multiple ways. Now, I've made I made pot brownies one time, and we. We took, we melted butter. We put the weed in the butter. We steeped it. It turned it like fucking green. Yeah. It, we filled it and then we strained it. And then we made these brownies and they were amazing. And we got just annihilated. So that is like a perfect example of infusion, right? But then you have like tinctures. Like, I don't even know what that is. So I would, I would like just like wind that back up and like correct you there. Like, yeah. I've heard the weed brownie story so many times and it's, you'll get a lot of people that, yeah, I had a, a pot brownie like 10 years ago and I got really fucked, fucked up, up off it. And I yeah. haven't touched it ever since. Right. right. Cause you have no control because you know, I had this moment when I was cooking with it and like my, my philosophy has completely changed over the years of working and learning more about the plant. This is really cool to be at the frontier of something new yeah. where the science is still coming out on it. We're still learning stuff. So, yeah. The goal of making the weed brownie is to get yourself really high, right? Like that's that's for, for for like the novelty, yeah. But like some I would, medical, I would, people, yeah. I would totally approach it different now as a chef. I would be like trying Correct. to make the yes. flavor work. I'd be trying to control the dosage. I, like with a chef mind now, completely different. But like, yeah. yeah, when I first did it, but that was like so you know where people look at potency being like the most like THC, right? THC is not what the culinary world is going to be most interested in. Okay. When we look at cannabis, the flavor and aroma that we get from it mm -hmm. come from things called terpenes. Okay. okay. So, but terpenes are also found in plants, fruits, and herbs, and the compounds are identical. So there is a terpene called pinene, right? That's okay. what makes cannabis strain smell really earthy. Okay. Um, it has a therapeutic effect. So it's responsible. If you ever use cannabis and are really focused, yeah. Right. It's got anti-inflammatory properties with it. Right. That compound is identical inside of a basil plant, inside of rosemary. Right. Interesting. So, so like right now, the industry has introduced to everyone sativa hybrid indica, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It's bullshit. That, that doesn't mean anything. Right. Sativa indica refer to the growth pattern of the plant. Okay. Indicas grow in colder climates. That's why the buds are firmer and tighter. Sativas grow in warmer climates. So they, the buds are longer and stringier. They're looser. So it has so, nothing to do with it has nothing to do with the strength and how you feel. Because I because well, because people always tell me when I when I've tried that yeah, consume cannabis, they're it wipes me out. No matter yeah. what. I get hungry, I get laughy, I get tired. I you can't, just, you, you can't yeah, do anything. They're like, I, you need a sativa. I'm like, I've tried a sativa. I've tried an indica. I've, yeah, I've tried so hybrids. And, and here's the thing, because I understand why introduce, you're introducing a new concept to a, a brand new demographic who don't know anything about cannabis. And they don't, like, if we use the terpene words like limonene, pinene, myrcene, caryophylline, like these are long scientific medical words that people aren't going to be able to use. So it's the terpenes in the plant that make you feel the way you do. Okay. Now, uh, there is a terpene called a myrcene, and if a plant is more than 49% myrcene, right, it's terpene makeup, then it's an indica. 
Gotcha. Right? Because okay. myrcene is responsible for the sedativeness mm-hmm. and it's responsible for the munchies. Mm. Right? So you're getting that no matter what. Well, no, because there is a terpene called humulene and okay. it's an appetite suppressant. Right? So you can find cannabis that you're not going to get the munchies on. Right? So I need that because I so got an expensive refrigerator. These terpenes are what responsible for the effects we feel. Right? Now, terpenes, we actually use them in everyday products. Right? Um, Pinene is the most used terpene in house cleaners, like Mr. Clean when it smells all piney. Yeah. So you're using a terpene. Your sage diffusers at home, those incense you burn, the liquid ones, those are terpenes, right? They're already extracting them. We find terpenes in wine. That's what gives wine its different makeups. Now, mm-hmm. everyone within our own body, we have an endocannabinoid system, and it's responsible for maintaining the balance within our immune and ner- uh, central nervous system. So when we get sick, it's our actual endocannabinoid system that's focusing on, on helping us get better and get back, right? So terpenes on their own aren't going to do anything to you, right? It's just a flavor and a smell, okay, right? But when terpenes are combined with cannabinoids like CBD or THC, they create an entourage effect and give you a feeling. Got it. Right? Wow. So whereas the pot brownie was always about let's get stoned off the brownie, mm-hmm. my dinners are about specifically using terpenes in the menu to make sure my guests are feeling a certain way throughout the dinner. Got it. The last thing I want to do is have everyone sedative and tired. Sure. Of course, one. Right, right. right? I want, want to do that, that at dessert so, and send them home to bed. So when I see you like drizzle on a tincture or an oil. So that's another thing, right? Like when I first started cooking with cannabis, I was using tinctures with a distillate and eye dropping. I see a lot of chefs doing that and that's fine. Because that's, it, but that's not like really cooking with it. You're just no, like. No, it's lip syncing. Okay. But you, term for it, slip syncing, lip syncing, but you know, listen, you safety is the most important thing right now yeah. because anyone who greens out or gets served too much and gets greens sick. Greens out. That's yeah, like, that's a green out. Okay. You get sick that's off me. cannabis. <laughs> Every yes. time. <laughs> right. Because that turns people away. Like if someone gets sick off eating it, they're never going to come back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've served 7,000 people now their first infused dinner, cannabis dinner. And about 700 of them have been first time cannabis users. Wow. And that's because I dose everyone individually based on their own tolerance level. But how, so, but that's because you're adding it after. So you're, well, no. So it how depends. do you, how do you do that with like, say, so say if a, I wanted to put it into a cauliflower puree and I like, I infuse and, the butter yeah. and I, and I, I cook my cauliflower and then I right. blend the butter, cream, cauliflower, season it. So I would stop you right there unless okay. you're going to serve it cold. Cause now this is, okay. this is the part of the culinary aspect where we have to start looking at it because one of the most important things that we preach with safety, right. Is you have to be a hundred percent competent in the dosage you're giving to someone. Right. And the thing with cannabinoids, when you apply heat to them, you actually start to compromise the potency and actually compromise the actual compound. So any, so we can make weed brownies. We can put the weed into the batter, put it in the oven, bake it. But why does Susie who eats the corner not feel anything? And then you eat the centerpiece and you're Gone. tripping balls in the corner. Right. Right. Why? why? A couple of different reasons. <laughs> One was the butter fully emulsified into the batter. Okay. Right? Or was it lazily put in there? Sure. And then w- was the heating in the oven even? Right. Right. So, so here's the thing. So tell me how this would work. So let's say I sous vide the cauliflower. So that's perfectly cooked all so the way around. Sous, the sous vide, that's, that's things. But so hold on, but I haven't put any, anything in there and I got my butter and the butter just goes in the blender when I'm blending the cooked cauliflower. That'll work. Yeah. That'll work. Okay, so cool. Um, kind of going back to t- just looking at the heat and everything. So the traditional method it tells us that we're going to cook with can- like cannabis flour, right? Yeah. That we're going to decarboxylate. And what that means, the decarb process where we, we kind of chop our flour up and we put it on the tray, mm-hmm. baking tray, and then we put it in the oven at 240 degrees for like 30 or 40 minutes because okay. we're going to activate, the plant has a compound called T. Hold on, is that 240 degrees Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, that, uh, the, the plant has a compound that's called THCA and then not until heat is activated on that compound, does it convert into THC? That's why if you were just to eat raw flour, nothing happens. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Right? So there needs to be a heat process to activate that compound over. Right? Um. Now, here's the thing is like, 
again, the goal was always how high can I get off my weed brownies, right? I want to maximize the potency, uh, originally, right? right. But now we're like, no, I'm, I want to focus more on these terpenes, right? Flavors, and creating right. experience. Yeah. Um, so we got to start looking at temperature. And so I've come with a rule of thumb. I don't go above 200 uh, with my sauces or even when I'm making so Grams? Milligrams? What are we talking about? 200 what? Fahrenheit. I don't oh. go, I don't go over 200 Fahrenheit. So I would say 70% of the time, I actually don't decarb my flour, mm. right? I will put it directly into my butter or my oil or whatever fat I want to infuse. Mm -hmm. And then I put that into my sous vide bath and it's more of a passive decarb process. Okay. Now it's, it could be anywhere from like 20 to 50% less potent, but it's going to maintain more of the terpenes. It's going to be more flavorful, more aromatic. It's going to taste better. Um, it's a, the method's called the Sedeno method and it's, it's okay. a passive decarb process. And, you know, people ask me, they're like, well, it's, it's not as potent. And I'm like, cool. Well, if your goal is to like get super high, then sure. But, you know, I'm going to go through these steps to make sure I'm a hundred percent accurate yeah. when I create the extraction. Now I'm going to go add it into my, my sauce or my call, let's say cauliflower puree. Yeah. Okay. The thing I'm going to have to do is I'm serving a group of 20, right? I've never met these people before. They've all bought in tickets. I don't know anyone's experience. Mm -hmm. So these people come to my dinners. It's important. And it's important. Right. And so they sit down and I've developed, I've got like a, a scale and I offer it to everyone. I always say to people, Hey, if you know your dosage, what's perfect for you, I'm going to come around and take it from everyone. Just tell me. However, I've got a recommended scale for everyone. It goes one to five. Um, one is the lowest, five is the highest. Uh, one's five milligrams of THC, and that's for the entire meal. And you're going to get about 15 milligrams of CBD with that, which is really important because THC can be like a rocket ship to your yeah. head if you're new to cannabis, right? Okay. And it brings on anxiety and paranoia, and you don't want your guests feeling like that. The CBD will actually suppress those feelings okay. a bit, okay. right? And it offers more balance. And that's mm. the real key when cooking with it is you want to be balanced with everything to give that person the right experience. You uh, are a fucking pro. <laughs> this is amazing. I've never, like, I've never sat and had that conversation with you and, and, you know, like just from yeah. the outside, I'm like, oh, he's cooking with pot because he loves pot and he's Canadian and rock on Travis. But you, uh, you really have taken the deep dive and you understand it all the way. And that's, yeah, it's, that's amazing. You know, cannabis has brought me all the happiness in life. I'll just finish yeah. on the, the scale and then I want to okay. slide to another story. We got a little game we're going to play next. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So one is five milligrams of THC, two okay. is 10 milligrams, three is 25, four is 50, and five is 100. Is this your made up scale? This is my made up scale. Okay. So people, you can go in between, like I, I come around to each guest and I take their dosage. You know, if someone's like, can I have two milligrams of THC? I'm like, yes. Because I get people that come to the dinner that don't want any cannabis, they're there for their partner, and then when you it gotta, comes, you got to trademark this is the Peterson scale. The Peterson scale. In like 50 years when all these restaurants <laughs> and you sit down, you're like, what's your dosage? The Nomad scale. You know? There you go. Well, so last summer we we launched the the, um, the very first recognized culinary cannabis certificate in Canada. And it was when I toured across the country, we certified the first 250 culinary professionals. Vitamix, Big Green Egg, Paco Jet, all supported all it. it. I partnered with a culinary company called Russell Hendricks. So yeah. they're the largest national supplier of equipment and appliances for restaurants. Wow. And this was the big game changer because yeah. I work with a ton of cannabis companies, but let's face it, the cannabis companies want to see all aspects of cannabis succeed because it furthers the industry. Right, right. But when I partnered with culinary companies, all of a sudden the media started showing up and taking it serious because they're like, okay, wait, like, you know, the chef associations, they do not benefit off the sale of cannabis, but they benefit off the future, future development of Canadian chefs. Right. My goal, I want culinary cannabis to be a Canadian cuisine. I want people traveling to Canada. You know, there's, there's tons of reasons people go there, but I want them to go there to eat cannabis, right. Yeah. And to get to, to taste our food with that. So that's, you know, Teaching the education has been, been really important. And that's what the pandemic gave me was time to sit down and write, you know, a course and right. take everything that I've learned and put it down on paper. Wow. Um, I'm doing something kind of similar with, with private chefing. Um, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to go into private chefing like I, like I've gotten into it. Cause I was touring around like you were, I was going to different States around yeah. the U S and doing pop-ups and, uh, and, and doing those kind of things. And, um, 
and then I I cooked for a prince, and that just like changed my mind. I was like, wow, the private chef world is fun, but there's etiquette. There's there's like unwritten etiquette that happens when you're private chefing in somebody's home, and there's a lot of chefs out there. And there there was a point in time where I didn't understand the etiquette and I was messing up yeah. and I've learned it over the years, but there's a lot of chefs out there that have no idea and still have no idea. And they're ruining the private chef world for a lot of people. And the private chef world and like the rogue chef is only going to grow. Yeah. There's only going to be like, we're seeing right. this big shift and change from, yeah. I mean, the, the culinary industry got raped through this pandemic right and, and so like, i mean i've never been so busy like i'm I, like well exactly I, i'm Private lucky dinner parties yeah, and stuff i'm right? lucky people and, want to do them more and i felt bad for a little bit because i was like man i'm like everybody i know is stuck at home and i was working every day i did a hundred days in a row breakfast lunch and dinner for a client a hundred days in a row and i felt like i was in the groundhog's day i was losing my mind because i was working and everyone else wasn't and i f- i felt terrible but it's it's uh it's fun. Okay, I want to play a game. All right, I want to I want to test your uh, your Canadianness. Oh my Canadianness! <laughs> All right. So we're gonna do a little. We're gonna I'm gonna have you throw on this blindfold. Okay. All right. And we're gonna do. It's gonna be a two parter. Okay. You might have to take the headphones off. Flip it over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Give me a second. I'm gonna set up here. I'm a very proud Canadian, so oh, I we're, I um we're gonna test that. I uh. Very much uh, better nail this test. Goodies. I just want you to know there's no such thing as Canadian bacon. It's called back bacon. If that's one of the ingredients. I did not bring the bacon. I was thinking about doing the bacon thing and I was like, you know what? That's too easy. (laughs) Okay. So this is this. The game is it's a blind taste test. I'm going to have you taste some things. Okay. And you got to tell me if it's Canadian or American. No. All right, here's the first one. You got to tell me if this is Canadian or American. Actually, I'm going to give you one, and then I'm going to give you the other. And then you're going to tell me one, which one one is and which one two is, okay? So this is the first one. Okay. Open up. (laughs) Well, it's maple syrup. (laughs) But that's American. It's full of sugar. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just make sure. Open up. (laughs) Which one's Canadian? Well, the second one is. Okay, you're right. So far, he's Canadian. (laughs) Okay. I don't allow Vermont maple syrup in our house. It has to be Canadian. Yeah, the other one wasn't even Vermont. It was was it was Mrs. Buttersworth. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's not even syrup. Man. No, it's, it's just disgusting. sugar. <laughs> it's disgusting. All right. So this next one, this one's gonna hurt a little bit. <laughs> All right, let's go. Here we go. I'm gonna give you that. Sip that. Enough, you don't have to take them off. <laughs> Woo. Okay, now take now switch. There you go. Sip this one, then you. I know I'm. I'm letting my palate <laughs> reset. <I'm>, <laughs> my first one's Canadian. <laughs> It's whiskey. Yeah. The first one's what? Canadian club? First one's Canadian. Second one is Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Two for two. <laughs> so far Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Oh, this next one's going to be good. You get some good memes out of these shots, eh? Tilt your head back like a bird. Here we go. <laughs> That's all you have to really do. This one, you just have to tell me what it is. <laughs> well, this is the American version. That was the American one, the first no, one? No. Oh. That was the Canadian version. This is the American version. Hump <laughs> <laughs> it up. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, they're French fries. You couldn't nope. tell the first time it was French fries? <laughs> they're really cold. Well, yeah. We don't have a kitchen in here. <laughs> Are you putting like different ketchup on it? Is it the sauce? This different? Yeah. The first one was Canadian? Yeah, the first one was uh, poutine. <laughs> that wasn't poutine. <laughs> it was fries and gravy. That is not poutine, man. Am I done? Can I take the blindfold off? Yeah, you can take the blindfold um, off. Dude, blindfold. If, if someone from Quebec saw you <laughs> call that too poutine, <laughs> they would kill you. <laughs> uh, man, I, that, went, I went on the internet and I followed a Qu- Quebec recipe and made gravy. You don't have the cheese curds. Well, yeah, I don't have the cheese curds. Oh, they used to have fries and gravy. Cheese curds are gross. <laughs> Well, kid. I have to say, you're you're Canadian as it gets. <laughs> you got it. You see what's going on in Canada right now? Yeah, this uh, this this protest. A protest. I, I'm I, for it. I have never seen my country so political before, or so divided. Yeah, and um, I think I was telling you on our way in here, the protest started last Saturday in Ottawa. The truckers went yeah. in, to, and look, I like like. It, this is a real easy one for me, and I can't believe it's it's an issue. You got guys that spend all day by themselves driving these trucks. They most of the time they pull up and someone else unloads it, and you're going to force well, them to get a vaccine. It, no, it's the truckers that cannot cross the border. Okay, right. So now we have the supply shortage hits Canada harder. Right. Our inflation's going up. No one's working. We've been locked down. It's Our a- three largest cities, fucking Quebec. Put everyone in lockdown. I'm friends with a chef. He's got the sixth ranked restaurant in the country. And the day before New Year's, they said, you're, you're all closed again. And there's a 10 o'clock curfew for all the citizens, right? Because COVID comes yep. out at 10 o'clock at night. So everyone's got to stay at home. It's just so, insane. You know, it, it's, I, the protest started with the truckers, but I think it's just everyone who's just fed up with the lockdowns and restrictions because Canada has been so strict. Like, I know it's strict here in California, but California's got fucking nothing on Canada when it comes to the way we've dealt with it. Well, right. I under, we have a public health care system, so we have to look out for it. I'm, I Listen, I'm triple vaxxed. I had to to travel around. Sure. I think you should go get vaccinated. But but that's why people are fu- are fed up because we, we, we've played along. For those of us that have, that have yes. done what we're supposed to, we've we wear the mask when we're out. We've gotten vaccinated. We got the second shot. We got a booster. Yeah. We got told we'd get these shots and we could take the masks off. And yeah. then it was like, nope, mask got to go back on. It's like it's another thing yeah. that it's like we keep doing stuff and it's not getting better. And then you find out you can still get it and you can still spread it and you still want to mandate it. Like, yeah. It, so I I support. I you know what? Listen, we live in democracies. So this they are it's peace, actually kind of peacefully protesting. It's kind of yeah, nice to see Canada going through this yeah. though. I feel like, I feel like for the last, uh, you know, however many decades, America, is, uh, we've always protested stuff. It's been yeah. a part well, that's of That's what our- I mean. We're, I've never seen it so political before. And, you know, just watching from the States, the media coverage is painting it out to be racist and all this stuff. And I have friends literally flying to Ottawa just to go check out and see what's going on. And it's not, and it's spread to six other cities now. And you know what? I'm proud of people for standing up and peacefully protesting to get this ended. And it's time, it's time to, for us to move on everyone, Yeah, you know? Yeah. No, it is. And, um, you know, I think your pop-ups and your... You know, your your cannabis dinners and the information, like, you're doing a good public service. I think you are. I think you're you're letting people know there's still a way to move forward and, and your determination I'm comes inspired. through I'm inspired. I'm really inspired with this. I, I mean... To, well, and I think you're inspiring people. And that, yeah, that I don't, you, you can't just... You can't just... And it's, it's, it's part of the best thing of this. Like, yeah. I never imagined I would be in this position and to be here. Like, it's really exciting. You know... Cannabis, literally, I was talking earlier about that big hole I had that just, I was yeah. miserable. Yeah. And cannabis has brought me, and f- cooking, all the happiness in my life. Um, you know, I did an event in San Francisco back in 2019, and I sold it out, and I just wanted to go have dinner with someone one night, so I went on Hinge and met a girl, and we went out for dinner, and I'm married to her now. Amazing. So, you know, it... Uh, it is, I've got to travel all around yeah. this September. We're heading to Europe. We're doing six countries. Um, now, hold on. Was she just like, now let's, 
she's just like, oh, this Canadian guy, he's great. But is he no, just tri- even, is he just even, tricking me no, no, so he so can even, move even, to the U.S.? Even more so <laughs> was the restaurant. I had never been to a Michelin-starred restaurant. I'm in San Francisco. It's my second time ever being there. So our date was for a two michelin star restaurant called mm. Birdsong. Yeah. And she actually had to go to Phoenix the next day. So she was going to cancel. But she's like... Fuck, it's a Michelin starred restaurant. Yeah. How often does this come around? And yeah. so my friends are like, You're taking a first date to a Michelin starred restaurant. Fuck and yeah. I was like, It's for me, man. I'm like, I don't want to go by myself. And like, I'm not doing this to impress her. You're like, This is where I'm you going know? to eat tonight, regardless. And, you know, I, I met my person. She's awesome. She tours with me every now and then. Like, That's she works great. remotely for her job. So last summer, we. we I was going to say, So how did she feel when you're like, we're going to get in this RV and go wow. do COVID dinners uh, across Canada. So, so Dude, we, you, we you, been, you like literally like, that's what bands do. Like I yeah. did, that's what's crazy. I did that in a band. We got an yeah. RV, we drove around the country, wow. we slept in Walmart so parking lots. That was eight months of being locked out of working, not being able to cook yeah. and smoking a ton of weed. <laughs> I smoke more weed than ever. Dog. Uh, we in one quarantine we smoked a half pound in 14 days i don't even like i don't even know because well, every I... time i'd go back into canada yeah. we'd have to quarantine for two weeks it was so strict and i uh. we, my wife and i put down a half pound <laughs> <laughs> i was cooking with it too but i mean there was a lot of smoke so anyways i just came up with the idea i was like because of the restrictions, we couldn't be doing events inside. Events had to be outdoors, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I was like, I wonder if I could get a cannabis company to sponsor me and get me a 30-foot RV, and we'll do pop-up dinners. And I did pitch it to her, right? And she, I, and I think just like my new, Euro, my new Europe tour, I pitched these ideas to her yeah. that are pretty far-fetched, and then I make them happen, yeah. right? And so I said to her, I said, hey... Like, but but sometimes you fly by the seat of your pants. Yes. <laughs> well, my pitch to her was like, hey, this would be like, this is a bucket list thing for people to do. Like, we're going to get everyone, because along the way, like, it's all elderly people in RVs, right? Right. But, okay. But so how, <laughs> right. So you're like, we could just park at these spots and be like, hey, you want a nice dinner? And you'll sell Yeah. So like. But what about like plates and cutlery? We, and- so it all got sponsored by Russell Hendricks. So I had all Churchill plates donated. Green, little, I got a mini green egg to take. Okay. Folding tables, but folding I'm chairs. About room. Like when we toured as a band, we'd have a trailer. Well, because behind. it was just me and my wife and our dog Dijon, and we know it was an extra large RV that had the bunk beds up top. That was our storage space. Oh my god! So all our glassware, um, plates, everything. We we smashed some plates driving, like turning corners and stuff coming out, and um, even more so was I so. We started on Vancouver Island okay. and we went all the way to Montreal and this was over eight weeks. Uh, we cooked 37 pop-ups for about just over 600 people. And wow. um, the the RV bed, like it was one of those like fold out mechanical beds and mm. I was sitting on the corner of it and it caved in on itself. <laughs> Right. And so we call the RV place and they're like, okay, when you come into Calgary, we're going to switch you around. Okay. So they give us a new RV and, and and what did they, th- what did the RV company think? Like you got a whole, you got, a, you got 80 <laughs> plates in here. You got, well, we had to empty it all out and then go and then get, but that RV company, they knew That's what, what I mean. By well, the they knew what the I was doing, they, the but they knew what pants. I was doing because it, again, it, it was in the press and media. Oh, I was touring across the country and doing this because no one had ever really done it before. And we were yeah. doing the culinary classes and, you know, they give us this new RV now we're having a major heat wave at the time. It's like 110 degrees in Canada, and it's, which is crazy. Listen, that is crazy. Last summer, right? Like, Jesus. And I'm cooking these events outside, like, and it's it's super fucking hot. Anyways, we rent. So what I do for my events is I rent Airbnbs, mm-hmm. and I use those as my pop up places. Right now, because of the restrictions, we had to Couldn't rent Airbnb. It. No, we had to get Airbnbs with backyards. Ah. So then I would. So we pull up to this house in Edmonton. And there's no AC, and it's 110 degrees. So we sleep in the RV mm-hmm. on the si- uh, sidewalk of the house. Do the yeah. events there. Then we go into Saskatchewan. We pull into this RV park. And when you get to the RV park, you got to plug in all your shit, right? Yeah, yeah. So I pull out all the wires and I plug it in and I got to plug the sewage in. Mm-hmm. And I go over to it and there's a stream of water squirting out. like, And I'm like, uh-oh. So when we picked up the new RV, like this was a brand spanking new RV with like no miles on it. Okay. 
Um, Where they, is this water coming from? Well, they left all the sewage hatches. They're, they're supposed to be closed. Uh, and, and because it was brand new, I don't know why, but they yeah, were all open. 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 So we had for about a week, all of our shower and sewage water. It was gone? No, it was sitting in this compartment that when I opened the door, it tidal waved out. Oh my God. It, oh, And so God. I had to put on like five of those. Luckily the COVID masks were everywhere. So five oh. COVID masks and rubber gloves and fucking. God. Right. So. Hey, the art, it was a cool fucking experience. See, I we had a rule when we were in a band and we were on our RV. There was, there was no number twos oh, on yeah. the bus. We would, it was always in Walmart yeah. or a we, church. Or we wherever. lived on that thing. We ate. Yeah, it, we did too, right? but you just, oh, yeah. you don't, you don't number Not two us. for that reason. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, you know, we are, it was a, a wicked cool experience. Um, I would, I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. One, the drive is forever. Yeah. Right. It's a lot of driving. 8,000 kilometers. It was like, I think almost 6,000 miles we drove. Did Holly uh, drive at all? Yeah. Just yeah. in Saskatchewan. She drove like, she drove like a thousand, uh, thousand of the kilometers. So like 700 miles. And then I drove the rest of it. Wow. It was a big RV, right? Yeah. So, um, I dig it. I've, I, that it was, was cool, like, man. It was, I mean, that's, we did it right out of high school, man. It was just like, it was like we graduated and it was like, let's tour. But you know, now it's led. So I've got a cookbook coming out in the summer, yeah. uh, released both in Canada and the US. Um, and, you know, that tour last summer in the RV was so successful that I have you more culinary no companies approach. So this summer we're flying. Right, and yeah. I won't be bringing the equipment. Um, Except any, your coolers. I'll have my coolers. <laughs> I'll have the coolers, but I'm not going to be bringing the tables and chairs. And we're going to rent plates of place. And and what I'm doing is I'm going to collaborate with a chef in each city. Yeah, like I like one of their more renowned chefs. I have nothing to do with cannabis. Mm. Um, so that way, our four course menu. I'm responsible then for two courses. Yeah, right, and I'll ride that through. So, um, trying you know, to lure me in. You would love to come back up to Canada. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Vancouver was dope. Um, that was my first time to Vancouver. Because you you went back up to Kelowna. Yeah. Kelowna was... That was what, May, I, wasn't it? Yeah, it was May. It was, it was beautiful. beautiful. I yeah. love... That's wine country. I love Kelowna. Yeah. Kelowna, Fornia. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's... That's, I think one day, we, like my wife and I would like to build a house and have something up there. I do. I would go so. back and I would go vacation there. Like, yeah. and that's, I mean, yeah. that's a weird thing to say, but that, that yeah. lake is beautiful. The food scene was great. Like everything was outdoor. We're, stay we're, ho- we're starting the there. tour in Newfoundland and I've never been there before. Oh, okay. Uh, and so Newfoundland is the far, far East coast and like. That's lobster country, and it's it's going to be beautiful. Are you going to cook with lobster, or you think that they're just like sick of lobster, you're going to avoid no, it? No, I, I I'm not going to do anything with lobster. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. you know. You'll figure it out. I'll, I'll figure it out. So. Dude, Travis, I think um, this is amazing, man. I can't I can't wait to continue continue to see what you're doing, Thanks. watching you. Like, I've, you schooled me today. I learned a lot about... Uh, we got to get you oh, certified. I can't I, dude, I, man. <laughs> I can't even smoke it. I don't even know what to, I don't even know what to do with it. We, one day we'll do a weed cookie together. So I got a little gift for you. Oh. A little a little epic mega cookie. I was cookie. just saying that to you. You thought it was just sitting here empty box? No. Right. It's full. I've been waiting to try it. You didn't one of win these. an apron, but you won an epic mega cookie. And the probably the worst poutine you ever have in your life. <laughs> no, no question. But, but you're Full on Canadian man, I, you dude. I, I want to. I want to thank you because honestly, that dinner I did with you, it sparked the whole chain of pop up dinners. It got me my first celebrity gig over New Year's. It it was just. I that, remember you getting that. And it was just that stuff. little boost. You know, those two years to where I needed to find where I was going. Yeah. I had these breadcrumbs along the way that just said, "Just keep going. Just yeah. keep going." And you were definitely one of those, um, you know, I'm proud of you, man. I'm proud to see where you've taken it all and what you're doing. And, uh, yeah, we got to get you back in the kitchen or at least at my dinner table. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it happen. We got a lot coming up. Um, we're, we're obviously recording this quite a bit early, but yeah. I'll be back on TV when this airs. So yeah. it's, it's going to be a wild ride. We'll, we'll definitely do stuff together. Yeah. Um, we have a friendship forever, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate you. Cool. Well, have a safe flight back. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you coming out, and I can't wait to do this again. And just smoke a joint again. All right. <laughs> Thanks, brother. And action. 